And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work on the political economy of climate and energy policy and how it relates to the question of how democracy can save the environment. My name is Michael Jacob from the Mercator Research Institute of Global Commons and Climate Change in Berlin, Germany. So in this talk, I will give four key points. First, I will provide a very short motivation for the question. Then I will talk a little bit about public support for climate policy, about the resistance of special interests, and finally draw some lessons, what this means for democracy and environmental equality. So, we all know that the Paris Agreement aims to limit global warming to two degrees or even 1.5 degrees. There's some encouraging development recently. Many countries have announced net zero targets. They want to go to zero net emissions. That's the European Union, China, Japan, and also Joe Biden has announced that the, the US policy will adopt such a, such a target. However, targets are not enough. You also need policies to actually put the changes, the transformations in economic structures into place. So there are many different kinds of policies you can adopt, like carbon pricing, subsidies for R&D, efficiency standards, and so on. But what determines whether policies are adopted? Well, for this, it's important to understand the political economy. And what is political economy? In a very simple sense, you can actually define political economy as the question of who gets what, why, and how. So basically, this means that policies are implemented to serve interests, serve interests of those actors that have the greatest influence on the formulation of policies. And these actors can be voters, can be industry groups, can be uh, trade unions, environmental NGOs, and so on. And actually, there's a huge interplay in actually policy formulation. And why certain policies are adopted depends on the question who actually can have a say in policymaking. Recently, we published a study that looks on the determinants of policy stringency. And we found that there are two factors that are highly influential. One is public support for climate change mitigation, meaning that you have many people who kind of believe in climate change and who believe that something should be done against it. And the other thing is governance, actually the quality of regulation, the control of corruption, to rein in vested interests, to kind of have a counterweight to those forces that want to work against climate policy. So first, let's look at public support for climate policy. You ask, why should policymakers care about climate change? Well, policymakers, are very much concerned about votes in democratic systems. So even if policymakers are not intrinsically motivated, if climate change becomes an important issue in elections, policymakers will pick it up. So again, let's look at US. Joe Biden was not a very green presidential candidate from the beginning, but um, the compromise with the party left who very much pushed for a Green New Deal actually made him adopt very stringent policy targets in his um, electoral program. Or also, if you look at this guy on the right hand, lower right-hand side, that's Markus Söder, um, the prime minister of Bavaria. He also turned very green. He was never really much in favor of free measures before, but now he actually realized that many people care about the environment and that including green aspects in his program um, can actually promote his standing and even promote his possible bid to become Germany's next chancellor when Angela Merkel's term next year expires. If you look at public attitudes in many countries, it's quite encouraging to see that even in the US, which has a high degree of climate skepticism, there's a constant share of people who are concerned or very much concerned about climate change. So. Um, this yellow line in front shows the evolution over time from 89 to 2014. You see that it always fluctuates between 15 and 70%. So there is an ups and downs depending on the recent developments. The economy, of course, is a very big issue. So in recessions, often the environment takes second, second stage. But still, even in bad times, you would have a majority for climate change mitigation. Or also look at what Fridays for Futures has done. Um, 
there's been a huge global movement for climate policy all over the world. Young people taking to the streets, demanding climate action. And this has made a difference. This has been picked up by policymakers. You might ask, okay, how actually is public support for climate policy determined? Mm, one thing, of course, is understanding of science. Mm, if you look at the diagram on the right side, on the left hand, this shows actually that the more people know about science, the more they are in favor of climate change mitigation, the better they understand the climate change is a problem. But here comes the downside. Um, this is highly polarized among party lines. Um, so this famous study from Matthew Cain actually asked people depending on the party affiliation. And he found this very striking result that the Democrats actually show an upward slope. That means the knowing you know more about science, the more you're concerned about climate change, as you would expect. But for conservatives, Republicans, it's the other way around. The more you know about science, the less you believe in climate change. So actually, climate change attitudes are very much a political identity issue. It doesn't matter that much what the facts are, but you pick out those facts that actually correspond to your party affiliation, to your other worldviews, and also what actually other people in your surrounding might believe. And this that is, that does not only hold for your views on climate change as such, but also what instruments should be implemented. So for instance, people who have more liberal wealth views might be more favorable towards market-based policies, such as carbon prices, whereas people who have more hierarchical um, wealth views are more likely to favor command and control policies, such as bans of fossil fuels, um, efficiency standards, and so on. And actually, you need a democratic process to reconcile these different attitudes. And also, if you talk about policy instruments, to see how you can actually strike a compromise um, to get people together. And for instance, in the US, there has been a move by conservative economists for a um, tax reform, a big swap, tax swap, to actually make the tax system more environmental friendly, while at the same time also doing things that might appeal to conservatives, such as reducing other taxes or using money to pay back public debt. So what about the resistance of special interest groups? Of course, you know, mitigating climate change means burning much less fossil fuels, phasing, fossil fuel, uh, phasing out fossil fuel use in the next decades. And of course, fossil fuel industries is a multi-billion business. So these are certain countries that are highly dependent on oil, on gas, on coal. Think about um, the Middle East, think about some countries in South America. And um, some estimates go that climate policy would reduce the worth of um, global fossil fuel resources by about 10 trillion US dollars. So that's really very, very much money. Mm, and the problem is, Climate change mitigation would, of course, yield benefits that by large exceeds the exceed the costs of climate change mitigation. But the costs and the benefits are unequally distributed. The benefits would accrue to everyone in the world, more or less, and also to people who are not even actively involved in the democratic process right now because it's a future generations. Whereas the costs, the loss of revenues, would be concentrated on very few actors, on big firms, think about the big oil companies, for instance. And for this reason, by something that's often called Olson's asymmetry, these losers have much higher incentive to actually lobby, to do something against climate policy, to induce policymakers to not adopt ambitious climate policies. So what do these special interests actually do to kind of soften climate policies or even contravene um, moves to put into place climate policies. One very classic way that interest groups try to influence policymakers is lobbying. So of course, in many countries, contributions to political campaigns, to electoral campaigns play a huge role. Also provision of information. So what kind of information you give to policymakers you always have a kind of battle that um, there are studies by 
the energy intensive industries saying, okay, if you adopt climate policy, this will be very expensive. This will lead to huge job losses. This will actually um, undermine our competitiveness on global markets and so on. And also, of course, um, doing public relations, producing YouTube videos saying that um, climate change is actually not such a bad thing, that there was a very good example by the oil industry that had a video that said, okay, some call it pollution, we call it life because CO2 was said to be uh, promoting plant growth and so on. There are other forms um, that are less legal, so to say. One, of course, is outright corruption, bribery, really going to policymakers, handing over money, <laughs> you can just think about like a little suitcase full of money. Or um, what's also very common in many countries, the so-called revolving door principle, that um, policymakers after the term in office get good jobs in these industries. Or the other way around, the people from industries migrate to ministries, then they work as a policymaker, but they still have very close ties to those industries. And they adopt policies that are more favorable um, to these industries. And also um, one strategy that has proven very influential is casting doubt on scientific findings. There's a very nice book from Norman Oreskes on Dale Conway, Eric Conway, um, The Merchants of Doubt, where they show how industry lobbies have time and again used the strategy to undermine policies, not only on climate change, but also, for instance, when it comes to smoking, to always say, the science is not settled. We're not certain that this is true. It might be, but we don't know. And they used every kind of uncertainty that has been conveyed by scientists to actually argue that it's an hypothesis, but we don't really know. We need more evidence before we can act. And actually, um, this has put scientists in a very difficult position because as a scientist, you want to be as transparent as possible. You want to show all the uncertainties that you have. At the same time, this always gave kind of a ammunition for skeptics to challenge climate policy. So what can you actually do to deal with these vested interests? If you're a policymaker and you want to introduce climate policies, there are actually two things you have to address. First, you have to find ways to compensate losers. That means you have to offer support to those who would be most severely affected by climate policy. So probably you will have to compensate owners of fossil fuels, you will have to compensate plant, uh, power plant owners for their economic losses. Also, it's very important um, to see how you can actually deal with workers because if many people would lose their jobs, for instance, in coal mining, you have to offer some kind of alternative so something like early retirement, like retraining programs, or also social assistance. It's also a very big issue on a regional basis to find ways to provide regional economic futures. That means there are certain regions, like for instance, in Germany, we have Lusatia, um, Lausitz, where there are not so many jobs which have been quite severely affected by reunification, and they're highly dependent on lignite mining. And if you take away lignite, you need to provide some other opportunities for people living there. So this means you have to set up some plans, for instance, to invest in education, to invest in infrastructure. And finally, certain consumers might be severely affected by climate policy because of higher energy prices. So commuters who go by car, like imagine someone who goes 100 kilometers per day by car, and if gasoline prices rise by 10, 20%, of course, these people would be quite severely affected. So you need some way to actually either give them money or to provide them alternatives such as public transport. On the other hand, um, you can create winners. You can actually think about how you can build up certain green industries that are in favor of climate policies. So if you have a big renewable industry, they might actually actively lobby in favor of climate policy. So to conclude, what does this tell us for the question, can democracy save the environment? Well, first, think about what is liberal democracy. It actually means a system in which you allow for very different values, worldviews, and so on, for a large variety of views, how you should actually live, how societies should be. 
and take, finding a compromise between these flows is necessarily a slow, cumbersome process. So the question is, are of the Ritarian regimes more efficient? Maybe they can build clean energies without actually having these cumbersome compromises. This might be, but on the other hand, you might also argue that authoritarian regimes are actually bad in providing the necessary innovation in terms of technological innovation, but also social innovation. And in the long run, um, authoritarian regimes might be not more likely to be able to address a number of problems. And of course, you can ask, if you have authoritarian regimes that are more efficient, do, do we want that? Isn't it like having a cure that's even worse than the disease? Would you want to live in a system in which maybe the environment is protected, but basic human rights are violated? Probably not. So finally, if you want to have an active, deliberate democracy that can deal with environmental issues, we need to bring in people in that kind of dialogue in some deliberate process where actively policymakers try to bring everybody on board in which people have a say in policymaking and which tries to achieve compromise based on scientific facts in the way that also limits the influence of special interests. Thank you very much.